anti-fragile, things gained from disorder. We're going to talk about this book. It's very interesting read, by the way, uh, to read this book, to think through it. It, uh, it has a lot of thought-provoking things inside. Uh, and especially for things we hear in, uh, in this century, a lot. Author gives like very so thought-provoking uh, um, arguments about this stuff and you should definitely check this book out. Now let's go through the notes and the biggest takeaways from the book. And the, the interesting and funny thing about the, this book is that author is ruthless to our people that write bullshit books. For the sake of writing books, he's like director, like a top writing some bullshit books and bullshit literature that is garbage basically. Which, and he says it in, uh, he refers to this kind of people this way. No skill to understand it, mastery to write it basically. These people are masters at writing it, but no whatsoever skill to actually understand what, are they, what they are talking about. And there are doers and there are uh, people that pretend they think, but where they are not, they actually think. And he says this quote: "Difficulty is what wake up wake up the genius." And the whole, um, you know, basically, what he explains here is this: It's a hard times that gives birth to something great. Um, in other words, to put it, uh, this is this way: We have benefited the most. Uh, from whom we benefited the most are not those who have tried to help us say with advice, but rather those who have actively tried but eventually failed to harm us. You know, there is this saying, right? Nietzsche's famous say, What does not kill me makes me stronger. People that uh, actually tried to harm you but didn't manage to harm you eventually made you stronger. But if they ma did manage to harm you, then you would you are you are dead so almost like you cannot watch this my my this video of mine and find find enlightenment. But yeah, it's absolutely difficulty. Uh, we can we can definitely say that difficulty really uh, wakes up the genius because um, you know just like there is no heroes in peace, right? There are no there. Are, for whatever reason we see like uh, interesting historical uh, historical figures such as on uh, the my, my interesting you know, most interesting figures such as Roald Amundsen or Titan the John D. Rockefeller you know if you look at really you know we are going to review this book at some, at some point um, if you look at his autobiographies or his biographies um, you know he was very broke as a child he had a tough life like we cannot even imagine what kind of life he had very tough life, insanely tough life. But at the same time, he, he became the John D. Rockefeller. He is the D. He is the Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller. No, we would not know. Like, we would never more, We would not know, know knew the name of Rockefeller if not this, this man here. Uh, I, mean, I refer to the book, of course, the title. We would not know about him, like, he, he he was born in a very difficult time, such as, uh, you know, for example, Roald Amundsen, that was, uh, sometimes he would stuck in this freezing, uh, in Arctic summer, like a very dangerous environment, and he managed to survive, um, you know, he injured his shoulder, where doctors told him that it's uh, surprising that you can move your hand, but he uh, did some sort of exercise and he healed himself by these natural workouts. And how, and how he would uh, leave the window open in freezing winter period of time uh, as a young kid as well. We're going to talk about him as well in this 150 book challenge. One of my favorite uh, biographies uh, in general, man. Now let's continue. This is, uh, this is all about perspective. We are, and everything is comparison, right? For example, my muscle, you know, maybe I'm 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 in good shape compared to certain individuals, right? So and there is this say, fools believe that the tallest mountain in the world will be equal to the tallest mountain one he has observed. 
Oh, this is stupid, right? To believe that Fool believes that the tallest mountain in the world will be equal to the tallest one he has observed. They're bullshit. Just because you have observed some, you know, why don't you assume that they're bigger? The more energy you put into trying to control your ideas and what you think about, the more you um, ideas end up controlling you. You know, this is a Chinese principle called, I don't remember, it's a very weird name. It just, it's, it's a philosophy. The basic idea is this. Uh, Robert Wynn talks about this, by the way, in 33 Strategies of War. Why do you, why would you and I right now go and pick a fight against a winter? Why on earth we would start declare a war against a winter? Instead of declaring a war against winter, just wait. And winter will go away. Why would you fight it? It's like it's like the more you fight it, like so. What are you going to do? Like, stop the freezing? And just like this, many work their reputation merely by trying to defend it. This is really, like sometimes what you opposite effects. Men and seven all the time. Sometimes best way to protect your reputation is to don't say a single word. Action. Action speaks louder than any word. Now, this is a very natural thing. And start to consider this. How easy it is to find the energy to lift a car if a crying baby is under it? Like there is this heroic desire, right? Uh, to do this action. And or to run for your life if you see a wild animal crossing the street. Um, you know, compare this to the heaviness of the obligation to visit the gym at the planned 6 p.m. time period. Now, the example we have read here um, is kind of, especially when you're like, how is it easy it is to find the energy to lift a car if a crying baby is under it, right? Because this is uh, basically in a situation appeared out of nowhere, you don't expect it that something like that would happen or some wild thing. So you have more energy. And how different it is from the schedule environment of, oh, it is 6 p.m., I have to be doing this. And yeah. And about the nature, this is, you know, nature is opportunistic, restless, ruthless, and selfish. Great, I love this. Uh, it's um, it is the way it is, you know. You you will rather submit to the trust or you live a lie. It's up to you. No, no big deal, right? It's it's totally up to you, by the way. It's really up to you. You can. You have to make sure in life that you make the right mistakes because there are wrong mistakes and there are right mistakes the right mistakes help you to grow help you to develop help you to become better stronger etc but the wrong mistakes ruin you avoid the wrong mistakes and make the right mistakes as fast as you can in short period of time as you can possibly can Uh, mistaken absence of evidence for evidence of absence. It's very thought challenging things say. And <sighs> here's the thing: danger is in the future, not in the past. Uh, you know, there is the I don't remember who said this or where is this, but I have always I'll, I'll, I, I for whatever reason I will always have this so thought in my head, and this comes from a pickup called approach pickup teaching. Uh, you know, generally cold approach pickup, just uh, going out and talking to a lot of people uh, face to face when well, perfectly random strangers, but uh, just for a challenge yourself. Um, it teaches you a lot of things, and one of the things it teaches you is that um, uh, safety is illusion. You are not safe. There, there is. Because you are so much out and so many people interact with, like just you just naturally start to understand that um, 
the the life is on the other side. I, I don't know if it makes perfect sense, but the life, the life where you feel, where I mean, truly you start living when you are on the other side, not here somewhere that you're safe, you're not safe. The, you are truly alive. You truly, you, you start to live on the other side, basically. There is uh, some sort of uh, charm in it or some, some adrenaline experience. Like you truly get it. It's not about uh, just a pickup only. Just generally get it. Uh, you know, some sort of satisfaction comes in. Right? For example, today to do this. Yesterday I slept it was uh, slept at 11 p.m. And I waked uh, up in 2 p.m. night, and I started uh, reading this book to finish reading this um, this book, and it went uh, basically five around five hours went since I woke up and started uh, woke up and started reading this book to finish reading it, uh, this book, and I have this uh, weird feeling of satisfaction because it was. I, will, I, will, I had like just general interest toward this book and I also have this challenge that I'm doing and it's not a very comfortable thing to do because I have almost three hours sleep, right? It's not very, but there is this some, I know that this, for whatever reason this is the best time I start to be more productive, especially and also, you know, street outside, it's much more calmer because cars don't move so much. I can focus more, I can be more in this moment, I can, can excel my thinking. Uh, and no, uh, just feel good about, oh, I did it. I actually did it. Great, good job. And I'm not, not, uh, not necessarily, I'm not satisfied not necessarily from just uh, commenting on other person's opinion and rising up from as an idea of AI. No. I like that, but yeah, this was my goal. This is interesting book. Also, here's um, the blog strong book. We are most likely going to review very soon because there are a lot of things I have to read and stuff for this challenge. And I generally liked these things. There are things I didn't disagree, but it's it's the it's on the other side. I could have kept sleep, sleeping, man, like crazy. But no, I just wake up, woke up, and did the thing. And it's rewarding because I've learned stuff right now that I'm sharing with you. So let's keep doing what I'm doing. Danger is in future, not in the past. And this one is danger also, right? Just like the savior, basically, so-called safety illusion, the danger also lies in, in the future, not in the past. And this comes from mindset. People say that, oh, the life becomes safer and safer, right? Um, or the thing that uh, you know people like to say is, oh, thanks to medicine and stuff like that, human life uh, expectancy is cool, and humans start to live much more longer. And uh, well, I'll throw kind of question this people, which, which is very interesting. Is this really because of medicine or because of the quality of life just improved dramatically? When kings and queens at some period could not afford this type of lifestyle, just an average person can have. You know, so it's it's really challenging question, and you know, just like it seems like because of that future, you know, danger, you know, there is no danger in future stuff or like futures, danger is in past and not in the future stuff. And, you know, people start to say, oh, there is no large scale conflicts like we see wars on you know, planet there, but they are not huge wars, right? to really bring in, destroy nuclear, nuclear wars or some huge super nations going head on head against each other that would bring massive destruction to the planet, especially if they went, you know, if they, if that conflict were to go on a nuclear or level, right, it would bring massive destruction to, not, not to this nation, but plants. And of course, every time super nations go against each other, the planet is in all order because super nations decide to go against each other. Right, and if you were to look at what could happen um, uh, from a nuclear war, war, uh, you you would not be so like a safe to right stuff. And there is the thing um, 
if you were, if I were to come to ask you this, hey, predict what will be in the future. That's not necessarily the right question because you cannot really predict what will be in the future because we can see throughout the history the uh, evident proof that hey, people have a different expectancy of what will be in the future. For example, in this book here, um, you know, Napoleon Hill has this idea that hey, in the future people are going, people are going to uh, have this um, basically communicate with it without speaking, speaking to each, with each other, right? You cannot really, uh, and here's what's wrong with it. You cannot, yeah, you cannot really uh, predict what will be, but you can predict what won't be in use, right? We can, for example, predict and say that um, in the future sales of physical books will decrease and electronic book sales will increase because of this and that and that. But who knows? Okay, this is um, when prediction becomes bullshit. Nobody can tell you, man. Like, and we're also after really getting like emotional. Like nobody can predict crap. Just check out how many times those experts being wrong. I remember some very famous student, I mean, right now we're you know, in 2019, very famous on entrepreneur, it's famous. Just so sharing on Instagram all his social media stuff, how he predicted one thing correctly. And I was like, dude, you have recorded tens of thousands of footage video series, tens of thousands of hours. You have said tens of thousands of bullshit things and you have for whatever reason manage to be slightly closer to trust and you're like oh look i'm expert i have actually predicted that shit i what the fuck it's like if you write a 10,000 page book it's like a design and you manage to finally say something smart what the fuck which one is, are you sure that thing you need to be so proud of? Just no, there is nothing wrong that you manage to program predict something. But dude, why you ignore the fact of luck in your so-called prediction? And why do you pretend that if you understood shit? Come on, just be honest. Uh, which brings us to a lot of emotional topics. I mean, because here's the thing. Of course, I, uh, there is not trust. There is trust, and everybody will understand. And not necessarily to know, but come on, you know, people can fool themselves endlessly. This is this is a quote worth writing down. By the way, people can fool themselves endlessly. Because remember this: you can you can fool yourself endlessly. And here is also interesting thought you can have in your mind. It it is much more easier to fool a ten million person human being than to fool and sim individual. Just think about it. Have that in mind. You know, and here's the thing. Someone who procrast um, also about pro procrastination is more about this subject. Someone who procrast procrastinates is not irrational. You know, we see this uh, things today that, oh my God, I, how to never ever procrastinate in your life. How to be in shape forever, 24 hours a day, the moment you sleep. Dude, you are obviously trying to sell something and are lying right now. Procrastination is perfectly natural thing. It's self-defense mechanism or stuff like that, but it's natural. And here's my explanation, totally. The dudes that, for example, uh, or people generally that advertise the idea of oh how to be in shape forever and ever. The moment most likely when they post their videos and pictures of their fit bodies, they are on pump, man. Do you know what it means? They have done some push up, some walk out to look themselves bigger. They are doing this certain stage stuff. Also, most likely this picture that pictures and stuff are highly edited. Nobody, you know. Do you know that bodybuilders, they are on the, the condition they are on stage, they stay on that condition very limited period of time. 
because the taper around that condition is dangerous. So I'm talking about pro it's here, not just amateurs. To say also not only extremely costly, extremely dangerous, extremely self-torturing. They can really short period of time. So you come here and be like, oh my, here's how I stay in shape, English thing, 24, whatever. Like, dude, like, just like that procrastination is perfectly natural. Sometimes you procrastinate. Sometimes you get tired and you have to rest, right? It's like saying, I never sleep. Really? Or I never do shit. Come on. Really? It's like perfectly natural things. You just have your inner bullshit detector on all the time. Just have it on. Make sure it's on. Your, what the author calls it, my, yeah, your inner bullshit detector over there. Just have it on. Yeah. How to survive advice. <laughs> this is interesting <laughs> you mentioned. There is definitely an entire book needs to be written about this thing. How to survive an advice advice. <laughs> How to really survive. Because as you know, I've been damaged by an advice pretty pretty badly. Of course there are, there are some advices that help me out, but there are some advices that really damaged. Uh, not damaged but wasting my time. I mean for example you wrote how I my I have a quality on Instagram and Facebook checked out. It's like a book stacks, religious book stacks. Uh, it's talks like putting uh, and I wrote it and I think how I became religious fanatic at some point of my life. Well all the, that thing came from advice because I picked up the book. So uh, how to survive an advice is really really is a great thing if somebody could actually teach you. To Basically, how to survive an advice to don't neither lose something or like how to really survive without getting damaged or stuff like that. It's really interesting because uh, people assume that uh, just because you get advice, you necessarily gain something from advice. Nope. Who told you that? Everybody, by the way, here is what one of the big characteristics of human, na human nature. Everybody has an opinion and everybody has some sort of advice, some bullshit advice. They can give you. If you go up to a perfect stranger right now, not perfect necessarily because the perfect stranger may be like surprised, like why this random person asked me, right? But anybody you know, and you know that that person has no other expertise in his uh, on that particular subject, like make sure that the person you are going to ask this advice has no other experience, neither experience neither theoretical knowledge in that subject in the field. So go ahead and ask. And don't ask something like, oh, astrophysics stuff like that, because they may be like, oh, I don't know. So ask something, something about basically social stuff or something like that. And when you know that that person really has no idea about it, that person still will give you some advice because people are reluctant. People really don't like to, I don't know if I use it for correct, right? Reluctant but really don't like to say that I don't know. People hate to say that. Swear. People don't hate, uh, hate to admit that they don't understand. And generally, this book is entirely about like we, how, to live, uh, how to live in the world we don't understand because everything is opinion. Nobody has an idea why we are here. Nobody. And at some point, uh, from scientific perspective, there's no question if it's a uh, right question to ask from that. Like, is, there, is there any point? Is there, is it even a right question to ask if there is a point or not? So yeah, have that in mind, I just said. And there's this also, right? People don't know what they want until you provide them with it. You know, biggest, uh, Inventions. Not only you have to, as an entrepreneur, for example, as an innovator, innovator. Um, not only you have to show people. Not only you have to innovate stuff. Basically, you have to also. You have to provide them with it. Like you have to also make them understand why they need it. Importance of that invention. Importance of. Throat. 
you know, and it's better to have an option, not obligations in life. It's not better, but you should have it. You should try to order to have an option, not obligations. Toward other people, this thing, because I, if we, because I agree on this sentence, if I were, if he's talking about in person to other people, but I, I do think that we, everybody has obligation toward themselves. I have obligations toward this person here. You shall also have an obligation toward the, the men or the women you see in the mirror. You have obligation. You own to yourself. Nobody owns you anything, but you own to yourself. You have obligation toward your, yourself. Yeah. And risk taking uh, is not uh, gambling and optionality are not lottery tickets stuff. And here is one funny thing. If the student is smart, the teacher takes the credit. It's very ob obvious stuff. If the student is smart, the teacher takes the credit. Yeah, I don't know what else needs to be said about it. I, if the teacher, the student is smart, the teacher takes the credit. But if a uh, student is dumb, then it's because the student is dumb. If a uh, student is, you know, don't, don't work out so well, stuff like that, then teacher says, well, because he's dumb. And then student, uh, and teacher don't say that it's my fault. Much of what other people know is not worth knowing. Mm. Yeah, because not only what mm, other people know is not uh, basically what majority of people know, right? Because. I mean, he refers to the television stuff, like this, uh, which creates distortion toward what actually is reality. You know, we, which creates huge gap. You know, the biggest tragedy of the world is like everybody can express their own, immoral, their own. Uh, I don't know even want to call the, this the things opinion, but whatever they are, and loudly and have. So, just because. You know, when you, here is my advice. When you go to a bookshop and you want to hand pick a book, ignore what you see in front, so called best sellers, because they are best sellers, not the best books. And go behind and pick classics first. It's very important for you to read classics. You know, there's huge importance in it. You know, and there are classics that I read once only, and I don't need or need to read them again at last right now in this 150 book challenge but, uh, before I started this challenge I was all day an avid, avid, uh, avid reader and I read thousands of books you know about these classics mm, I read a lot more than thousand book so far about this uh, because of uh, this endless challenge I did this like for the reason I decided to make this seven month challenge to read a book in a day and I remember it was the hardest thing I did. I would choose normal size books, uh, really huge books, too, and I would make sure to read them. I would sleep the proof myself, I would not eat, I would not, uh, but I would make sure to finish them day. Because then I had this board of uh, challenge, this challenge, and I had to, after I would finish the challenge, I had to make X as a symbol of, yes, it's their time, I finished it, something. So, and, and as you know, I have made some mistakes. So if you already read that post, so I will upload in Instagram. Um, I've wasted a lot of time last two, two years of my life reading religious books and teaching the old general literature I would like to read. But yeah, there are some classics you have to read. You have to read Man Homer, Odyssey and Iliad. Yeah, they're amazing. You, you have to understand these things. Because, yeah, classics, uh, which will, will give you a new perspective. And when you go to bookshop, you usually won't find this kind of book as a bestseller. Read the Stendhal. Arthur talks about Julian Soler, or Soler in the book. Uh, he wrote this book, Red and White and Red, I believe. Or Black and Red, this is the name of the book. It's a Stendhal's book. Um, basically, the main character is the Julian Sorel, the guy that wants to get become wealthy and decides to become a priest because of it and 
he has this life and ends up in guillotine for stupid reason he can could easily bail out himself but becomes very emotional he has all these lovers all this life you won't find this book necessarily in front you have to go backwards somewhere um you, know, you won't find these books you know yeah and they are reading worse reading those ones some and some may be worth reading more you know i read for example all chairs book more than four or five times because it gives you a new perspective it gives you a different it, you have to basically you know also has this thing what well, well, oh, quote here uh, i've written what i was given to study in school i have forgotten what i decided to read on my own i still remember all these books i've just made started to brag about right it may seem like i'm not bragging at all you know I have picked these uh, those books. I have uh, picked these books from because of I wanted to pick them, not because uh, of some school or some educational system told me to. I no, just I had genuine. I started that you know every day read a book in a day challenge because I was just genuinely interested. I also remember I had this uh, note a notebook basically, and I also write down every single book I read. And I stopped it at 211. And this number is stoned in my mind. 211. And I stopped because it was just too boring to like, open and write these books down. And I just throw that notebook away. It was just too boring to write these things down. It was a couple years ago. I mean, but I still remember that now. It was 211. Because I, I first I wanted to experiment what it feels like to read more than a book. And I was like, well, I mean, it's like. It, it was, but well, my point is read what you are genuinely interested in picking game. Oh, the color changed weirdly. Whatever it is. Yeah. Just pick what you are genuinely interested in reading. Yeah, that's all. You know, trust brings hatred. Not everybody wants to listen to trust. Uh, and you don't have to... Basically, those that truly want to understand things, they will find a way. Those who don't want, they will find excuses not to do it. Keeping one's distance from an ignorant person is an equivalent to keep companies wise and inserting interesting perspective. Good is mostly in the absence of the bad. 